Thank you all for coming to this year's last lecture. Glenn Wacom, an MS4 who has experienced years of mentor mentorship under Dr. Campbell, was supposed to give this introduction, but unfortunately, he is out of the country today, so he asked me to read his words for him. Dr. Campbell was nominated by UCSF medical students to give this lecture, and after all of the different schools on campus had an opportunity to vote from amongst incredibly talented nominees, he was chosen to be this year's last lecture speaker. Dr. Campbell is a native New Yorker who completed his undergraduate degree at Harvard University and went on to attend our very own UCSF for medical school. He loves the field of medicine so much, he initially completed an entire internal medicine residency <laughs> before eventually seeing the light and completing a general surgery and critical care fellowship at Columbia Presbyterian. Dr. Campbell returned to UCSF after training where he has remained as a trauma surgeon at San Francisco General for 23 years. He is an extremely accomplished, nationally recognized surgeon who has won nearly every major teaching award here at UCSF and on a national scale in addition to numerous titles and committee positions that would take too long, to, too long a time to list. Rather than list his numerous accomplishments, I would like to shed some light on what Dr. Campbell means to UCSF medical students. Dr. Campbell is a third year clerkship director, so every student that graduates has the pleasure of learning from him. If you have ever been in a room with Dr. Campbell, trust me, you would know it. <laughs> He has a physically large presence that is, <laughs> that is only dwarfed by his booming, infectious laugh. Walking anywhere with Dr. Campbell always takes twice as long because he stops to say hi to everyone, and I mean everyone. From department heads and other physicians to residents, nurses, students, and probably most importantly, the cleaning staff. He is tr a truly inspirational man that inspires many of his students, like myself, to follow in his footsteps to become surgeons. But more importantly, Dr. Campbell inspires all of his students to not only be better physicians to patients, but better people as well. So it is with the utmost honor I ask, on behalf of the UCSF student body, Dr. Campbell, if you had but one lecture to give, what would you say? It's indeed a great honor and a privilege to be selected to give the last lecture this year. I follow the original person who gave the last lecture, Randy Pouch, who was a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. His lecture was nothing short of spellbounding for me. He, as many of you know, had a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And with metastases, he starts the lecture by showing a CT scan that's full of tumor. Then he just goes on to give an absolutely fabulous talk about his life and things that are important to him and in front of the students and the colleagues that he loves so much. Randy ultimately succumbed to his disease a year later. I follow also, I'm the fifth recipient of this award and I have several recipients are here. And I follow a distinguished number of them to do this lecture. So I want to just thank when I got nominated, I was really surprised and even kind of scared and nervous a bit. <laughs> it's a prestigious honor, and you get nominated for a lot of stuff around here. And I said, oh, I got nominated. So OK, I got nominated. <laughs> then I got a note. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's feeling my pain over there. That's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> so then I got the note that I was selected. And thank you for turning on the microphone, although I probably don't need it. <laughs> That's right. I like the microphone. Could you hear what I'm really saying? You can really hear me talking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, 
most things in medicine, especially speaking, doesn't really bother me a whole lot, but it's not often that you have all these bright lights, all these people to get streamed on the web. It's a pretty fancy thing. So I hope that there's not a secret, something I don't know, that will make this my last lecture, <laughs> and that tomorrow <laughs> I won't be around, right? <laughs> There's no secrets that I know about, right? I hope I won't be bushwhacked out in the parking lot. <laughs> and that'll be the end, right? So you gave the last lecture and you were gone, right? So. <laughs> so I don't have any shocking announcement, but just some thoughts that I'm gonna share with you about my journey uh, through my life to this point. And I said, I'm deeply honored to be selected to be given this address today. So if this was my, my last real lecture to give. There's some themes that I'd like to discuss and many stories that will relate to these themes from the experiences I've had in my life. And that's Randy there, so if you want to see, that's how you spell his name, right? So you can see that. So the themes will be the importance of family, uh, passion for what you do, no matter what it is, the agony and ecstasy, and I'll go through that in detail, because there's a bunch of that. <laughs> the impact of teachers and mentors, I'll talk a bit about social ju justice, importance of friendship, and that you have to learn something every day no matter what you're doing. And at the end, I'm gonna talk about Campbellisms, right? I didn't know what they were until one, one of my residents told me that there's a lot of Campbellisms out there, and I said, I didn't know that. <laughs> so so I'm, gonna talk to you about, I'm gonna talk to you about Campbell's world <laughs> at the end, and uh, that'll be the end of it. So let me just start off by saying that <laughs> Just to clarify, anybody who had any concern, who was the real Dr. Dre? Like, I am once again the real Dr. Dre. <laughs> so, this will be the story of the real Dr. Dre. Because <laughs> I became Dr. Dre in 86, 85, and he started NWA, which I won't repeat here, in 1986. So I'm, in fact, a year ahead of him. Now, I'm not worth $880 million, though my wife would love to have me worth that much, right? right I hope that she doesn't t take the rich guy, because then she could buy some more shoes, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm here to tell you about this. So, the real story of this is, the other name to talk is the story of Dr. Dre, right, or Campbell's World, and so I'm gonna tell you that uh, tonight, well, during my talk. So as I look out in the audience, I was thinking about what I was thinking about when I was your age as a medical student and, and other students here at UCSF. Um, I thought about, well, what was I thinking about now 30 years ago? And what I found something very interesting is that I found this. I found someone who looks like me. <laughs> they probably sound like me. He smiles like me. He's got big glasses like I do. So. And I was interviewed for the alumni news for the class of 1985. The magazine chose representatives from dentistry, medicine, pharmacy, graduate division to interview, and I was one that chose, and I chose for medicine. I thought it would be nice to start this talk by just sort of talking about reflections that I have after 30 years have passed, and weaving the threads that I talked about at the very beginning. So of course, I got more hair there, all right, and, it's, and, and, and I have more gray now, so I do look different, all right, unfortunately. Right, the School of Medicine at that time had 142 graduates, and the, the article talks about my time growing up in New York City. I spent his undergraduates, and they started to quote me, and I'm just gonna quote me talking about me. <laughs> so I, that's a good place to start, like me talking about me. That's okay. And I came out, so to quote me, and the reason why I came to UCSF, when I came out to talk to people, I found that students here were more enthusiastic about the school than anywhere else. Oh, that's pretty true, right? I thought that was good, right? That was important to me, and plus the fact that clinical training seemed to be better here than other places that I was considering. Are you kidding me? Everybody here was enthusiastic about medical school. They love medical school, right? There are other comments that, that I made about my great experience with UCSF. They asked me about what it was like to be a minority student. I said that UCSF is well known for its record on recruiting minorities, and I just hope that they keep working hard to stay in the position that they've had in the past. Now the other quote is, um, what I like most about being a physician is that your special position where you get to know people very close in a very short period of time. And that's what, that's what the, the quote that they have there. 
My family, especially my parents, were always there for me when times were rough. I think the biggest thrill was graduation, having my mother and the rest of the family here. That was really nice. And I saw myself practicing in a big city, even a clinic or private practice. I think I got that wrong. <laughs> I'm a big city, so that's good. One nice thing about being a physician is it gives you a lot of options, he says. I think the most important thing is caring and be very good at what you do. And I try to do that every day. So this is what it looked like in my graduation. Those of you gonna graduate in a couple weeks, you could see what it kind of looks like there. That's me getting hooded by my mother. I had to bend down a lot because my mom was really short. <laughs> I tried to knock, not knock her over when I bent down. That's me in the front row over there smiling out of all cheese. All, right. all cheese, all smiles like everybody else that day. So the quote reflects my thoughts at your age and what my career would be like. Now 30 years later, I can share with you a few thoughts. Now many of these thoughts are really personal since I was convinced that Harvard and UCSF had made a mistake when they accepted me and graduated me. I was actually really scared of what it would, would come with the rest of my life. I was wide-eyed and excited about the future as many of you are now. I was also worried that I would make a mistake and somehow be found out that UCSF had made a mistake. There's a syndrome called the imposter syndrome described by Pauline Rose in 1978. It's a fundamental premise that despite tremendous accomplishments, those who are affected by this syndrome persist in their denial of the capabilities that they believe they have. They fooled others and assist them to achieve their status. I know all you guys have that feeling, because I did. I was looking forward to the adventure and returning home to New York City, and I was still immersed in the turmoil about my career choice since I had decided to do an internal medicine residency, but still had a surgical fire burning in me. So I was not sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. But I was committed to learn something every day and make myself a better physician. I always wanted to make a difference in people's lives, but I wasn't sure what type of physician I was gonna be. As a medical student, I was quite confused about my career path and what path to take. I was attracted to, to be, and became passionate about four areas that are totally unrelated. <laughs> Internal medicine, pediatric surgery, and OB. <laughs> now they're all really different endeavors, and I have to admit I was confused as a student. Pretty confused. I always had the impression the skies would part, and the clouds would open up, and all of a sudden it would be crystal clear about what specialty you're gonna go into. Now does that sound familiar? <laughs> so the internal discussion in my head was going on something like this. And this is what it looked like. This is your graduation last year. All right, this is what it looks different now. Now the, uh, the faculty is on the stage and the students are in the, in the audience. I thought that was pretty cool sitting up there doing that. So, so this, is, uh, this is some graduation slides. Uh, these are my classmates. That was Dean Rudy Schmidt. He was smiling because he was happy that my class was graduating because <laughs> he threatened to dispel the whole class because we refused to take an exam while we were here in medical school. That's why he's got a big smile on his face. <laughs> right, and I'm just cheesing because I'm just happy. And that's my friend, Phil. So internal medicine. I had, a, I had great role models in medicine. I enjoyed thinking about clinical problems that were presented to me. The differentials were interesting but I always felt that I wanted to do more. I was inspired and interested, but I still had issues with this specialty. It was a path of least resistance, or so I was told. So I decided to go into medicine and maybe I would pursue a career later in surgery. The truth be told, I was brainwashed by this man. <laughs> I totally brainwashed. I mean, it was terrible. <laughs> he had a whole spell, he cast it on me, and I was like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Understanding that I still wanted to be a surgeon, but I was like, man, I got to do this. So I was all over the map. He was my advisor during medical school, and he uh, helped encourage me to do medicine. I was kind of all over the map, really, at that time. My father died suddenly in medical school and really struggled with his loss and what it meant. He had suffered from rheumatic heart disease and needed to have a second vial replacement, but never had the surgery, and passed away when I was a third year medical student. It took me some time to recover from his loss. I returned to my clinical duties in medical school. As I trained in medicine, I had challenging cases, but I felt that I would not, not doing all I could do for my patients. I had several challenging patients who helped me make up my mind. There was the 18 year old girl who basically had sexual relations with the wrong person and developed AIDS and before AZT was present. And she later died under my care. 
I remember admitting her to the hospital and her mother crying out that her baby was dying. I saw her frequently while, she was, while I was treating her CNS infection, brain infection for those of you who are not medical, and a serious fungal infection for months, but she was scared of dying, so she would come to talk to me every couple of weeks as she was dying. I had a 60-year-old patient who was, had coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, you name it, he had it. It was time for him to get a routine EKG. So I sent him to get an EKG, even though I looked for 20 minutes to get a, a wheelchair to help him uh, get, to, get to where he had to go. I couldn't find it. And when I sent him, he started to have chest pain. He had to be admitted to the CCU for rule out myocardial infarction. These cases and more led me to switch into surgery. I also met John Lindenbaum, who became a mentor and a friend. John was a huge jazz fan, and we used to go to concerts together with my wife, his wife and my wife, future wife, Jillian, because we weren't married then, but we were an item. <laughs> we'll go back to the official and the unofficial years later on, but that's, <laughs> we'll talk about that's, a, that's, a, that's later on. Right. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. So he and his wife would go mushroom hunting and bring them home to eat. I could testify that they tasted pretty good, but I worried about my liver every time I ate them. <laughs> He became an advisor and helped me get into my final decision. And most of the other faculty of medicine I talked to in cardiology, GI, and pulmonary, they all told me that they wanted to be a surgeon, but they didn't want to put up with the time it took. So they cast encouraged me to go into surgery if I was really considering it. But I didn't want to be 50 and say, okay, is this what, I'm in the wrong area, and I made the wrong career choice. And it was wrong for my personality. Now this is what, it, what I used to look like. Now just in case you didn't think I did medicine, I just want to show you that, right? That's me, right? And that's me, I'm a little more hairy there. <laughs> right, and that's the whole group. This is 85 and that's, that's 88. I, I missed the picture in between. So I'd like to share with you the story about my ultimate decision and what happened. I discussed my decision of going to surgery with John Lindebaum, who we had gotten pretty close on many occasions. I finally got to see my program director a name Dr. Robert Glickman. Dr. Glickman was really old school. We didn't talk during my entire time much during residency. He only talked to residents who fast-tracked and became research scientists in our group. He found out that I matched and served for my future chair, Keith Reinsman, at a party. Needless to say, when I finally talked to him, he unleashed tremendous anger on me because he felt betrayed. I tried to tell him I wanted to make an appointment and he canceled it three times, but he wouldn't hear any of it. He essentially cursed me out and dismissed me from his office. He didn't talk to me for two months, even though he passed me every day in the hallway. It was not until I was on the wards that morning that every day he acknowledged my presence because for months he never did. The lesson I learned from his experience was to keep your superiors in the loop, even if you think they're not interested in your career. I think he felt betrayed that I didn't discuss my career plans with him, and he was embarrassed when the chief of surgery told him that one of his guys was gonna be one of his guys. So what? It was a tough time, it created a fair amount of pain and agony for me uh, during that time, but it was really tough to, tough to get, get through that. Now John was a champion of diversity and knew how important it was since he spent many years working in Harlem Hospital during his career. When you look at the picture, the one thing that stands out here is that I was the only black resident in the picture. That's correct, the first year there was three, then there's two, and then there was me. We were both determined to change things and increase diversity in Columbia internal medicine residency. So with his help, even though I was going into surgery, we recruited three outstanding African-American residents into the medicine program, and I was able to make a difference. And that's John Lindenbaum there. And they were fantastic residents, and together we, we basically started a trend that continues at Columbia today. John has subsequently died of lung cancer um, and uh, is no longer with us, though he was a really fantastic guy. As you will hear, I had a great experience with young children growing up. My mother was a foster mother, and I'll share with that in a little bit. We had 15 to 20 children, stayed at our house for 25 years, off and on. I really enjoyed interacting with them, and I had a great time in the pediatrics rotation. I did, however, not enjoy the parents. <laughs> the parents were all crazy and sometimes difficult to deal with overall. Yeah, I know you know that, you know that right? 
They made caring for them a challenge. Now, I understand that now because I have my son, and I've been difficult in that direction. So I <laughs> have been problematic. So I enjoyed my rotation OB. It was, it was really exciting. Delivered babies for the first time. Surgery was great, but I thought that women really should control surgery. And that I then uh, decided that, I, that in terms of the surgery discussion in my head, I loved surgery, had the passion for the specialist, I was really in, but I was intimidated by the residents and the training. I just always thought it was too hard at first. But then I started to meet several people who changed my mind. I, I was exposed to Karen Devaney. Yes, I ran into Karen at a meeting uh, a couple weeks ago. Karen is an amazing surgeon, scholar, and teacher. She's a tremendous role model for me and helped me decide that even though I had done medicine, that surgery I could do later on. She's a guiding light for me as a mentor, teacher, colleague, and a friend. Karen crystallized for me that surgery was the greatest field in medicine for me. She's now a professor of surgery at Oregon Health Science University. After she left UCSF, her and her husband, Cliff, moved to UPenn and then went up to HSU. I also met um, other people who were fantastic in surgery. And that the person on the right is Dr. Thomas C. King, and on the left is Dr. Ken Ford. Dr. King was my future program director, would always tell me that surgeons had more fun. Don't I tell you guys that when you come and talk to me? <laughs> that we have more fun. Ken Ford was a colorectal surgeon at Columbia. They were both role models for me on my journey through surgery. Dr. King was like my surgical father. He was a consummate teacher, surgeon, and scholar. He would always set examples for us, always say to the residents, your job is to teach the students, and if you're going to be here, you better teach the students. He was the first surgeon in the United States to get a master's in education. He was a master surgeon educator and supported us through our training. He just lost his wife recently of 60 years. Jody just passed away suddenly about uh, six to eight months ago. He's now been retired for 20 years, but I keep in contact with him. Dr. King is the reason why all his residents became outstanding teachers, why I became interested in surgical education. Dr. Ford was always a fantastic surgeon, patient teacher in the operating room. He also was a scholar, teacher, and surgeon, and always let me dictate the operation, and I said that was great. But then afterwards, he would use a red pen and to help me understand that I was not present for the same operation that we both did together. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, I guess I didn't see the same case. He was always extremely professional with the students, and the residents knew the literature, and the patients loved him. He also used to quote Shakespeare in the operating room. Ultimately became a trauma surgeon, ICU physician, general surgeon, and clinical educator. Always loved caring for the critically ill since I had been training internal medicine in New York in the 80s, and we had a pretty big crime wave there, so it was really, uh, that's what attracted me. So ultimately I became the accidental trauma surgeon and professor of surgery at UCSF School of Medicine. She so asked the question, where did I come from? So I'll show you. As you know, I'm, I was born and raised in New York, and I spent close to 30 years living there. I attended grade school, junior high school, high school, left for college, came back again, you know, came out here, spent a year there in New York, went to UCSF, and then I came back, then I went back there and I did my training there. Like many other families in the U.S., my family immigrated from another country to seek a better life here. In light of the way immigrants have been talked about recently in our national discourse, I have to say I'm proud that both sides of my family come from Jamaica and the Caribbean. So I'm of West Indian heritage. Don't laugh now. <laughs> my wife thinks I'm a fake West Indian <laughs> because I was born in the United States. I'm not real because I wasn't born there. But that's where my family comes from. As you may or may not know, Jamaica is 90 miles south of Cuba and the Greater Antilles. There are 2.9 billion people on the island. That's the flag up there. So uh, 4,200 4, square miles. You think it's much bigger because there's Jamaicans everywhere. Everywhere I go, I run into Jamaicans. I was in Brazil at a conference and I ran into a Jamaican on a, on a tour. I was like, Jesus, there's Jamaicans everywhere. <laughs> so initially it was called Santiago by Christopher Columbus in 1655 and it became Jamaica when the British took it over. Was heavily involved in the slave trade in the 1700s, 1800s. The slaves were emancipated in 1838, prior to the emancipation of the United States, I may add. And in August 6, 1962, independence from the United Kingdom was achieved. So I have two parts of my family. One part comes from this place called St. Anne, which is like right there. 
and the other part comes from St. Elizabeth over here. So it's on both sides. My grandparents on my father's side, um, well actually my, my mother was born in Jamaica and my parents were born there too. My father's parents Im immigrated to the United States in 1920 when they came by boat to New York City and started their new lives. My grandparents on my father's side was named Ivan Ronald and Zephanella Campbell. Yes, that's a correct name, Zephanella. My grandfather used to call her Zephy for short. As in all immigrant stories, I left Jamaica at a young age to search for a better life 98 years ago. My father was born four years later in 1924 in New York City. Interesting enough, he was born in the US, but there was a practice for young people to spend time in Jamaica. As a child, so he went back there and spent a lot of time living there. My mother immigrated to the United States in the late 1940s after being born in Jamaica to start a new life and live with her sisters in the Bronx in New York City. My mother was one of 10 children. Her sisters had a lot of children too. She had an incredible number of cousins since her sisters had anywhere between two and 15 children each. That's a huge family. I guess in the country there's not a lot of other things to do other than make babies. So there's a lot of babies. Her brother each had 10 or more children so growing up in New York, New York City, everyone was living, it was pretty interesting. My father was the only child, but my grandparents on that side had, had 10 or more siblings each. My parents had a sister and me in the late 1950s, they, and they got married in 1965, 1956. This is more stuff about Jamaica. <laughs> Man, that's a great beach, huh? Oh, it's really beautiful. So that's what they looked like when they got married. My wife was born in Grenada and she later immigrated to the United States where their family later became US citizen. So growing up with a large extended family was pretty interesting. We got to know the process of immigration up close and personal. It's really hard for me to find pictures of my parents because they, they never really, my father was very camera shy. He never really took pictures much. So several relatives would come and stay with us for extended periods to get their papers together. I knew at an early age what a green card was. I knew the importance of US citizenship. My father was a janitor and my mother was a foster parent. Over a period of 25 years, we had 15 or 20 children come and stay at our house for sometimes weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years. Some children stayed for months and others stayed for 12 years or more. One stayed for 17. I learned how to care for newborns at a young age. Sometimes the children would come one week after they were born. I learned how to change diapers, feed and burp, do all the stuff I usually do, and do it in between all my homework, because I always had to babysit when my mother went out, along with my sister. My mother ran a daycare center in the house, and we'd have four or five children at home every day. That's probably why I later entertained the, the possibility of becoming a pediatrician. But imagine me being a pediatrician. Do I look like a pediatrician? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> not, not, not. Not that pediatricians are wonderful people now. <laughs> <laughs> my mother had two children of her own and lived, we lived with many others. My brother Joe was my best man at my wedding, he was the closest confidant, and I speak to him several times a day on the phone or by text now. He was one of the children who spent 10 year, 12 years with us. And my sister still lives in New York and she, she raised two of her, or two of our nephews there. That's what I look like, I had to show you the pictures, right? Obligatory baby pictures, that's me up on the top left. I'm about three months old. That's me, I'm a little bit older there. And that's me, I'm towering over everybody, really bigger than everybody else there. And then, <laughs> and these are some, this is, that's Joe and that's Nancy and that's Donna. So I had no physicians in my family. My father never finished high school. My mother never went to high school. My mother made me firmly understand at a young age that 100% grade was better than 95%. She was very good with numbers. <laughs> I would bring home pretty good grades in school, junior high school, middle school, and then I'd look at her and she'd read the report card and she would just give me the eye. She'd be like, yeah. Like, where, where's that higher grade? I'm like, come on now. <laughs> like 96, 95, that's not good. I want 100. I said, wow. <laughs> that, meant that, she knew, <laughs> that meant that she knew I could do better. Even though I was one of the highest performers on the exams, she would go back and say, you could do better. I had many teachers who helped me get excited about school at a young age. And this is uh, uh, Mr. Claude McMorris. Now Claude is uh, no longer with us, 
But Claude was the one who really ignited my passion for science and interest in, in, th in thinking about things scientifically. He really made everything in my sixth grade class a lot of fun. It was just really exciting. He's one of the first people who encouraged me to think about science in a fun way, and that started me down to the road to medicine. Before I was in this class in the sixth grade, I thought about having a military career, but Vietnam changed that thought. <laughs> and as you can see, that's uh, Colin Powell there. Carl Sagan was really fascinating to me because he was you know, astrophysicist, he was excited about things, and, he, and I really got excited in being either an astronomer or an astronaut, so that's Neil Armstrong on the moon. I even thought I was gonna end up like uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I know Neil, and Neil's a terrific guy. But uh, I don't think so. Neil and I were about the same age, so we were in the same class when we went to Harvard, so, so it wasn't there. Or this is Levi Watkins, who's a cardiac surgeon who uh, worked at Hopkins for 40 years. So I decided to be a surgeon. Growing up in the 60s, I exposed to landing, black and white TV, and of course, high definition did not exist. I know that really disappoints you. <laughs> I was exposed to black and white TV. That's all we had. There was no remote control because it hadn't been invented. And there's only really eight channels on the TV that we had. Imagine eight stations in black and white. I'm sure that'd shock all of you. So the things that excited me about science and taking care of people, making people better, made me think about a, a career in medicine when I was pretty young. So I said that when I was 13 or 14, I was going to be a doctor. Interestingly enough, I had a grand aunt who would call me Dr. Campbell all the time. Because remember that when she first saw me, when I was a couple months old, but she started calling me by that name. I really thought she was kind of odd. I was like, why is, this, why is this woman like calling me that, right? I always thought she was crazy, but I humored her anyway. We lived with my father's parents growing up, so we had a big extended family. When she called on the phone, she would call me, is Dr. Campbell there? And I was like, wow, she really was a head case. <laughs> the only reason why she would call was to give my grandfather the daily numbers. Now, many of you don't know what the numbers are, but let me just give you school you a little bit on the numbers. The numbers at that time, and they still play numbers a bit now, I think, was a daily betting operation run illegally. And occasionally, the numbers runner would come to our house when my grandfather hit the number and give us payment. He used to have me count the money so it'd be okay, so he wouldn't get gypped by the numbers runner. This was, of course, illegal, but I didn't know much about it. You can think about it as a precursor of the lottery today, except it was totally underground and illegal, but I guess the statutes and limitations are over, so I guess I'm okay. <laughs> Growing up with a large extended family meant we always would celebrate holidays with my Aunt Julie, who was my mother's older sister, and the epicenter of social entertainment for us. That's Aunt Julie on the left over there. We'd go to her house, and all the cousins would be there. We'd go by subway since we didn't have a car. I have fond memories of dozens of people in our house having a party, but I did notice one thing is that that slowly but surely her block started to disappear. That meant every time we went, there would be fewer buildings on her block. And this was urban blight of the 1960s and 70s in the South Bronx, and I was witness up close and personal. We'd go there and there'd be less buildings, there'd be less buildings, there'd be open lots, garbage in it. So it was sort of an interesting sort of uh, time in our life. That's my grandmother up there, that's Granny B. Uh, that's one of, she was, I think I was about 13 or 14 then, and that's my mom with two of us there. Now, those of you who laugh, sometimes I talk about being a surgeon and riding on my white horse to save the day. <laughs> I found a white donkey. <laughs> but a white donkey is not the same as a white horse. So <laughs> white horse is more majestic, it's bigger. It's, a, it's got more stuff on it. <laughs> you know, you move faster. <laughs> so our vacations when I was young consisted of staying with my family in Jamaica and the Caribbean for weeks or months sometimes. It's really fun since everyone met, my aunt would say that that's your cousin, and it would actually be true because I had a lot of cousins. <laughs> We'd go to visit my grandmother in a rural part of the islands, and that's grandma up there. First time she went, there was no electricity, no running water, and the bathroom we used was an outhouse. Now, if you're, if you're from New York, using an outhouse is not very cool. <laughs> and it was not cool. <laughs> but I, I thought I was roughing it. And we returned to Jamaica a number of times, and and um, had really a wonderful time with our family. So I grew up in the southeast part of Queens, which was interesting. Yes, I ended up, uh, my family's from Jamaica, and I grew up in, a, in Jamaica, New York. 
Actually, it's South Jamaica, New York, all right? That was kind of interesting. The neighborhood that I lived in was mainly black working class people, and I attended initially, uh, uh, the neighborhood changed over time. I attended public school in a place called Rochdale Village. It was the biggest cooperative development in the world when it opened in 1962. And when I started to go to school, the neighborhood was in the midst of change. I started marching in protest lines for budget cuts and closing schools. I know how tumultuous things were, and there was a turbulent times with rioting, protests, civil rights movement was in its infancy as I was growing up. My school was undergoing tremendous change. I witnessed white flight to the suburbs up close and personal. My friends would move out to an area of Long Island, Brooklyn, and many other places. The school changed from being a melting pot to being 70-80% black, and only white students were enrolled in certain classes. I was witness the social change when I was in school. Still did a great job educating us, even though there was tremendous change in the student, student body. I learned at an early age that to be colorblind with my friends, and you have usual ups and downs, but uh, we, in general, got along pretty well. I was fortunate as a youngster to be involved in many different things, and this kind of shaped my experience and a lot of the, the things I kind of think about and the way I approach things. So I'm going to share a couple experiences that I had as I was growing up uh, with you and some trials and tribulations. I was fortunate at a young age to experience a unique multicultural experience called Camp Rising Sun in Rhinebeck, New York, and that's what this is here. Camp Rising Sun is an international scholarship camp for boys and girls. And for many years, it was just boys, but we ended up making a co-ed experience because we didn't think that was right. In fact, we had to, we had to storm, the, storm the, board of, the, uh, the board of trustees to make sure we came co-ed. It was founded in 1930 by George E. Jonas, and he was known as Freddie. And that's actually, that's him. That's the, that's the old guy up there. That's, uh, that's, that's Freddie Jonas. Freddie had made a lot of money during the, the Depression in the hat business and basically spent um, um, part of his fortune to open up the camp and set it up. When I attended in 1970, there were 20 boys from abroad, 20 from the U.S. and 20 from New York City, eight weeks in a multicultural experience. And the basic principles revolved around understanding friendship, leadership training, helping understand the importance of teamwork, and to help the, the, the campers understand the importance of altruism in your life. For many of us, it was a truly transportive experience. I was a camper for two years, then I spent 13 years on the board, helping the agenda of the camp. We had the usual camp activities, hiking, canoe trips, arts and crafts, but there were also periods of instruction, educational topics, and there was construction. The idea of con construction was to build something or participate in a project that will make the camp better. So a part of you would leave, in a sense, part of yourself, either in Rhinebeck or now Clinton Quarters, which is the other camp that, was, that, was, that we bought. I also learned how bad I was at playing soccer when I played um, the campers from Europe, Africa, and South America. They really beat my pants off. We also had other activities that we geared up to help campers know the issues that come up in their lives and communicate their concerns to others. I'm still in touch today with some of the campers I met during that time. It's also a time for you to interact with other campers in Europe, South America, Africa, Asia, the Middle East. We always talked about current events and try to wrestle with the problems of the day. No issue was too difficult for us to talk to with Palestinian campers, Jewish campers, African campers, European campers. This camp helped me understand what true friendship was about. It's not about how many Facebook friends you have. True friendship is about people who help you when you're in trouble, and they stand up and assist you when you need it. When you have a bad day, they support you. When you have a great day, they support you too. And after family, it showed me how important it was to have solid friendships during your life. I'm going to talk to you about another group that I was involved with. When I was in high school, I was selected to participate in the pre-medical research and educational program. Now, this program was started under Alice Miller in 1968 to expand the pool of underrepresented minorities who are physicians in New York and the United States. Although, if you ever, if, if you ever knew her, she was a very unique person. I'll just say that she was a social activist, philanthropist, friend, and really a mother or sister figure for all of us. Though if she ever knew I said that, she would kill me. She had the idea that the interest in medicine was cultivated and supported. Those students who were from underrepresented minorities would become successful. She obtained funding from Josiah Macy Foundation, the Milberg Foundation, Mount Sinai, and NYU School of Medicine. She raised tens of millions of dollars from a private foundation 
to run the program over a 20-year period. The program had several phases. There was a year-round program. There was a summer program. There was also uh, opportunities to work, study in the summer, which I participated in all those. The ac academic was support, but the real part of the program, and one of the things I want to drive again, this is another example of the, the friendship thing I was talking about, is we, are, we essentially were all nerds, and we supported each other through college, medical student, and life. The group of people I met in prep are still my friends now, 40 years later. This shows, slide shows a few of the people uh, that I know some of you may recognize. I know the surgeons recognize some of the folks that are here. This is what we look like uh, when, when just a few years after we finished. Um, and I'll just go there. This is Bill Stahl. Now, Bill, and, uh, Bill Stahl was married to Alice Miller, who basically ran the, the organization. Bill just died a couple years ago at the age of 90 after a very long career. This is Yvonne. Yvonne's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at BI in Boston. Gina works as, a, as an HIV researcher in NIH. This is Henri Ford. I've known Henri so long, I knew Henri when he was Henry. Well, that drives him nuts. <laughs> it drives him nuts when I say that, right? But we could take that, since it's being videotaped, I can say that, right? Because I got the bully pulpit, right? So Henri is now, he's the uh, vice president and, uh, and surgeon in chief at um, LA Children's Hospital. Uh, this is Joe Wright. Joe Wright is the is professor of pa pediatrics at Howard and a chair of pediatrics. And these two guys here, this is three guys who went to Stuyvesant. That's me, that's Michael Watkins, and that's Orlando Curtin. Uh, every year when we have a meeting, we take this picture. Mike is a professor of surgery at Harvard, and Orlando is a professor of surgery at University of Connecticut. So some of the, and this is, in the middle here, this is Mike Butler. Mike Butler is, is a surgeon who's also chief medical officer at the Jackson Memorial Health uh, um, System, and, and he runs 10 hospitals. And this is my buddy Valer. My buddy Valer was married to Diana over here, and about 20 years ago he had an accident where she was killed in the accident, and he became disabled. But he still does a lot of work now managing his assets, and he does a lot, he has a lot more assets than I have. And he also, uh, goes to Haiti and works on, on projects in Haiti after the, after the earthquake. So we've had an ongoing conversation with each of these folks for 40 years. I mean, last week I had dinner with Gina and I had dinner with uh, Yvonne. Yvonne is, as you may notice, Yvonne is struggling with, uh, with a diagnosis of breast cancer and she just finished her chemotherapy, which she's doing really great. Now, what I'm doing when I receive phone calls from any of these people, whenever you receive phone calls from your friends as you grow older, make sure that you answer those calls. We created a, a network amongst all of us. And Alice and Bill were a truly remarkable couple. He was a trauma surgeon, chief of surgery at Metropolitan and later Lincoln Hospital. He supported her, her work 100%. He would spend late nights talking to us about our future in medicine, all right, when he had to be at work in the morning at about five in the morning, but he still stayed there. Many of us participated in the program, and we later became counselors to help the program work afterwards. The program started in 68 and ended in 1988. Alice and Bill lived on the Upper East Side in a rather large apartment. Now, I didn't actually know what that meant until actually I went to their apartment. It was a 15-room apartment on Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue. And I was like, wow, that's a big place. They had so many rooms, they had rooms to put rooms in. I was like, wow, that's a trip. Well, in addition, they had a house in Montauk, Long Island, which they invited us out to spend time with them. Alice, you can call at any time, no matter what's happening in your life. And where the challenge would be, she would come and support us. She looked at it as a 30-year program because it would take that long for us to get to the point where we can help others behind us be successful. She never asked for anything in return, and between two or 3,000 students went through it. Many are, su are successful physicians today. Alice died in cancer in 1988, and Bill just died, as I mentioned. So I'll share with you an experience from our group that was quite personal, and I think this shows you that you're gonna have challenges. And this, I think, was one of the more difficult things I had to deal with throughout my life. One person who's not pictured here is Lisa. Lisa's a dear friend and the reason I got through college and medical school. She was like a sister to all of us. We both attended Harvard College. She went to Harvard Medical School. I went to UCSF. And we kept in contact with a whole group of folks that we have who were up here. So we stayed in contact, we'd hang out in the summer, and, but after Harvard Medical School, things started to take a dark turn with Lisa. She had serious depression and elements of bipolar illness. She struggled with an illness for many years. We helped as a group as best as we can. We even made her get admitted to Mount Sinai for mental health and later McLean Hospital for mental health. 
She finally got out in the midst of completing her internship at Harvard Medical School. One night I received a call from Joe, that's Joe over there, that at least had died by suicide. One part of the story I did not mention is that she tried to commit suicide a couple of occasions did not, and we didn't even know it. Even though we tried to help her, we couldn't overcome the pain that she felt. Even though we tried, to, or we can, we couldn't do it. And this experience made me really to respect the psychiatrists that we work with. They really do tremendous work. Their experience has brought all of us, this experience has brought all of us as a group together. When we talk to each other, it's like we talked to each other yesterday. So even though it may be a year or two, we still stay in contact. We all love Lisa and we still miss her now 27 years after a premature death. But our friendships are the things that sort of kept us together over the years. So, I didn't really care for the title of this and I also didn't care for the picture. The picture makes me look about 100 million years old. <laughs> you know. I go to this woman's house, she's got a whole house, the camera's full. She's like, this is a tintype picture. They used to take pictures like this in 1989, 1880s. And I'm like, you know what, can I just send you a color photograph? <laughs> she's like, no, I had to do that, so, so, you know, you get blinded by the light. <laughs> but this article, this really talks about something I want to share with you, just, because you're going to have struggles, and, and this was a big struggle for us as a family, and, uh, and me and my career. One of the biggest challenges I ever had was when I broke my ankle in four places. I had a surgical meeting in 2001. I was in Banff, Canada for the Pacific Coast Surgical Association meeting and to say it was cold would be an understatement. It was minus 20 in the Canadian Rockies. I was carrying my son, can't do that now because he's bigger than I am. Right. He was on my back and I put him down and I said, oh, there's some ice on the ground, I gotta be careful. I heard a snap and I thought it was a tree going down but it was actually me. At six foot two inches, I'm not a short guy, and I'm pretty big. And what I was hearing, instead of a tree falling, it was me, my bone snapping, and I had broken my ankle. And I was like, wow, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at my ankle, and it was independent of my foot. <laughs> and I said, oh man, this is a terrible problem. <laughs> what made it worse, Bill Schechter, who's sitting in the audience over there, he comes up to me, and he tries to feel my pulse like a dutiful surgeon, right? It's minus 20 degrees, right? You think you can feel anybody's pulse when it's minus 20? <laughs> Bill's like, I can't feel your pulse. <laughs> I'm like, you're not helping the situation. <laughs> my wife is crying, my son's crying. Bill's like, you have no pulse in your foot. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm really having a great day here. <laughs> So when your foot is not anatomical, you know you have a problem. I detached my foot from my lower leg and the doctors had to nail it back together. Now Bill was fortunately on the trail that day and, and helped get me treatment. And I was in Canada and I had engaged in the Canadian healthcare system. And at the hospital I refused pain meds because I was hard headed. Because I wanted to see my own x-ray before I had altered my, uh, my, my senses were altered. I saw how serious it was and I, but the surgeon didn't operate me on me until the next day. Guy was really nice, and I said, oh, that's fantastic. I said, how come you didn't operate on me on the same day? And he told me, he said, I knew you could wait, and I was, having home, I was at home having dinner with my family. I said, that's fantastic. <laughs> I hope it was a great meal. I was just here making a fracture blister <laughs> and minding my own business. On the second day in the hospital, I called a nurse and told her to take out my IV and give me pain meds orally. I was leaving. They wanted to keep me longer, but I just needed to be fixed and get the hell out of there. Physicians, as you know, make terrible patients. We think we know everything. So I had a, high, a trimiola fracture, and that's my ankle. That's the, real, that's the real picture of my ankle over there. So I have four Canadian screws in my ankle. <laughs> so when I, have, when I have pain in my ankle, I can blame Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he said, oh, you'll be back to work in eight weeks. I said, oh, that's great. The fall happened in February, and I couldn't operate until June. I couldn't even walk without a cane until October. So being a surgeon is physically demanding, as many of the surgeons in the audience, you'd be standing for 12 hours. I said I was at home for three to four weeks, going to rehab with other patients at San Francisco General Hospital. Couldn't sleep at night without pain meds. This experience was very humbling. It helped me understand what it's like to be a patient and to suffer. My wife helped me every step of the way, and, I, and I'm really lucky since she was about to kill me, 
because I was driving her nuts. As a surgeon, not being able to operate is pretty terrible. And that's what we do. We take care of business. We stamp out disease, make the world a better place. I was the one to ride on my horse and save the day, but I couldn't do that. Something like this changes your view. For a long time, I thought I had to be the only one doing everything, but then you realize that the world goes on without you. I don't have to be the one doing everything. The surgeon did an excellent job, the best he could. But I found a physical therapist to be really fantastic people. It wasn't until eight months after the injury I started feeling normal. I was able to get my function back, but I still, couldn't think, do, I still can't do the things that I love to play, basketball and other stuff. Running used to be pretty fast, but it's not me anymore. And it's never really the same. It's, it, it's okay, but it's not what it used to be. So that's my therapist, Kevin, over there. And uh, that's what he looks like now. Um, he is, was really fantastic. I mean, he was, uh, he was a champion. He supported me. You know, when I was down, he, he, he brought up my spirits. He taught me how to walk again and, and get treated and get out of my cast. When I took off the cast, I know I had a chicken leg, and I truly realized how, how much time it would take for me to come back because what I do is physically demanding. And I said, Jesus, I just started to cry because I said, man, I'm going I'm to come back a long way because my leg was half the size of the other leg. It had totally atrophied and was nothing left. I remember driving for the first time. I could use my leg in the car. It was really liberating. And again, my wife was a saint. She had to drive me around to all my appointments. It was tough on us overall. But it was a true part of the agony ecstasy when I was able to go back to work. One great story I'm going to share about my rehab with one of my patients in the basement of San Francisco General Hospital. So, so I, w I went to do rehab with all the people I had operated on. So that was kind of an interesting experience. <laughs> my injury is around the same time that Timothy McVeigh was executed. So I'm doing my exercises one day and next to a guy who had a knee replacement. He starts talking to me about his experience in jail. I mean, having no experience in jail, I just started listening. I had nothing else to do other than do my therapy. Turns out he had been in Angola State Prison in Louisiana. He had many stories about being there in the guards and being in solitary. And to sort of say that it was an unusual day in my physical therapy would be an understatement. Uh, so, so I have to say uh, that it was fascinating that he felt comfortable enough with me to tell me his whole story at a really difficult time in his life. My ankle is still fixed and does occasionally feel stiff. When I beat it too much and work too hard at San Francisco General, I have aches and pains. But I'll go down to physical therapy and Kevin and others will have suggestions. Kevin, Ben, and the rest of them and Mary are fantastic. We're also fortunate to have such a great department in our, in our, in our hospital. So when I send my, my patients down there to do that, it really, I know that I'm sending them to a really great place. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, another goal of friendship, and this is um, a, a, a program I was involved with when I was in high school, just to sort of talk about, again, this issue of friendship and people building you up and supporting you when you're, when you're going through difficult times. While I was in high school, I was fortunate enough to be selected to be part of the Archbishop's Leadership Project, which is sponsored by Terence Cardinal Cook and the Catholic Archdiocese of New York City. Though I was not Catholic and didn't live in Manhattan or the Bronx, they accepted me into the program. The program was run by Father John T. Mann, who's standing next to me there in a photograph that's a little bit old now, but it's, that's what he looks like, and that's what I used to look like. The program is run, uh, the goal of the program is to train young men who are African American to be leaders in their community. The program consisted of weekend retreats, history classes, reading lists, networking with other members who had participated in the program. The program was started in 1968, and I entered the program in 74 to 76 when I was a junior and senior in high school. The program was rigorous. I met many of the people, some of whom I'm still in touch with today, and I still have lifelong relationships with them. I gave some of my first speeches uh, there um, a long time ago. And I later spent time helping younger people behind me uh, go through the program as a group leader. This program still goes on today, and it's been placed now for over 40 years. Many of these talented young men have been who African American, became lawyers, businessmen, physicians, entrepreneurs, and a priest with two PhDs. The theme was excellence in all, always do an outstanding job whenever you, you, you do work on your goal and do the best you can. I'm going to show you something funny because this guy over here, that's me with a giant afro back there. When I finished college, I decided to take a year off before applying to medical school and I ended up living with Father Meehan in a place called a Pier Toussaint residence in Harlem. There were a lot, a lot of priests and nuns were kind of unusual, but I found it to be a lot of fun. We had many great dinners and I learned how to cook for the group. 
If I messed up, they would talk about my poor cooking skills the entire meal, so I learned how to cook pretty fast. <laughs> At that time, it was a pretty rough time in New York City, and our neighborhood was pretty intense. I spent a year for applying for medical school and faced my first big disappointment. I was scheduled to do research with a mentor that I had picked, and the funding was lost the week before I started. So here I was as a Harvard graduate without a job. I said, that's a problem. So I think if you keep in score, about that means that I lost that one. <laughs> I worked hard to get a job and ended up doing research at Columbia in a genetics lab and counseling inner city high school students at a community service agency in East Harlem. And I got into medical school here ultimately a year later. Father Mina is an Irish priest who spent 40 years of his life living in Harlem and working in the community. He's an extraordinary person. He's an advisor, mentor, teacher, and confidant for many years. He married my wife and I, even though I was Lutheran and she's Episcopalian. We've now been married 25 years. That's the official count. The unofficial is 30. The official count is 25. Right? All right, next month it'll be 25. At the UN Chapel in New York City, and I'll show you some pictures later on about that. One experience I'd like to share with you was while I was walking home one night after an early movie. It was kind of crazy in New York at the time. I walked up in an active gun battle, battle two blocks from where I lived. When I saw the action, turned, I turned around and ran as fast as I could. When I saw the muzzle flashes, I knew I was in the wrong place, and thank God I was able to extricate myself from that situation. I learned a lesson about being present in the situation that you're in and really watching your surroundings. It was quite scary for me, and I'm happy that I'm alive to tell you this story as, as I grew up. So I'm going to go back to the issue of family and how important that is. And I'll show you, and I'll show you some family pictures because it's really been a lovely 30 years with my wife. We've been together. As I said, we're coming up on our 25th anniversary. She's been a source of inspiration, strength, and support my entire career. And she puts up with me, though I go in the doghouse a fair amount of times. I try to stay out the doghouse. Most of you who are not married don't know what the doghouse is. But you can get out of it if you behave yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your love and support over all these years. I first met her when I was on call at Columbia. I used to go to the MICU and ask for coffee because she used to be on a night shift. And of course, she used to refuse to give me coffee. Then I'd go back again to try to ask for more coffee. She'd say no. I'd say, can you have some? She said, I'd say, please, pretty please with sugar on top, and maybe I'd get some. But be careful if, you don't, if somebody refuses to give you coffee because you might end up marrying them. <laughs> We've been a great team, and I just want to tell you how much I love you so much. I promised her that today I would not go to New York. Now, New York is an expression that we use, and I'll tell you some of the stuff that I have later on. It's an expression we use when we're being direct and using salty language. And I think some of you may have seen me go to New York once or twice, because <laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's my son, Andre. You know, he's a lot bigger now. He's sitting over there, right, when he was small. That's my mom. That's my sister and me, my mom. And this is now my, my, my wife's family over there. And this is my brother, Joe, and his family up top there, so on the top. We were visiting there, and Andre's a lot smaller there. But it was a, we were visiting them in Washington, D.C. at the time. Yeah, I bet you didn't think I could clean up so good, right? <laughs> Man, I look good in tails, don't I? I look very sway from the boner. And of course, my wife looks absolutely beautiful. And this is a picture of me when I was, when I was in high school. There's some other things. These are uh, my, this, this is my reunion picture. The folks I went to, you saw some pictures of the folks who I went to UCSF with on the top left. So, so diversity has always been very important to me, and I'm going to address that in a little bit. But this, these are my, this is my rooming group when I was in college. Right, it was me, I'm African American. My roommate was Latino, and we had a Native American, and we had an Asian roommate. So we kind of had everything covered. <laughs> all right, all the way around. That's some more pictures of us over there when we were, we were in college, and that's, that's the two of us. I had a lot more gray hair then. That's what I used to look like when I was a resident. That's our wedding day. Now, I love this picture here because it shows my wife smiling, right? She's just happy to be married. And so am I. It's wonderful. And these are pictures that we had of us uh, when we were younger. So my son has been truly amazing and a fantastic person. Each phase of his growth has been really fun. 
He's grown up and now he's turning 18. He's going off to college. The next phase, we're able to become empty nesters. This would be a great time for him, but if you see me crying in a corner with my wife, quietly, you know why I'm crying, because I miss him a great deal. We're big basketball fans in our house, and, we, and he's played the game for many years. Last four years, I think we've been to about several hundred basketball games. I was talking to my wife about that the other day. People ask me what my hobby is, and I tell them it's watching basketball, right? That's what my hobby is, right? Really spent nine or 10 months a year involved in school, basketball, AAU, other outlets. It's really been fantastic. We also got a chance to, to go to some Warrior games, and that's just the Warrior game there. That's really a funny thing. That's a fathead of my son, which is like totally hilarious, <laughs> right? And he, he had to take the, the camera from me because he said I wasn't taking a selfie the right way. <laughs> he said, I'm not taking a selfie the right way. So he's like, this is how you're supposed to do it, right? So we're at a, we're at a, we're at a, a fair in New York City, and he's taking a selfie, and that's him uh, playing basketball, and that's the two of us at the Hearts and Heroes. We're proud of his accomplishments and his successes on and off the basketball court. I keep telling him he's a scholar athlete, with emphasis on scholar, right? I hope he internalized that message, right? So. And this is, uh, this is some more wedding pictures. And this is a picture, uh, this is um, my wife's uncle Winston or Winston Grant. Winston Grant was uh, someone who was killed in the Trade Center. He actually was a father figure for my wife uh, throughout the time he was growing up. And, when I first met him, he actually was a really terrific guy. You know, the first time I met him, when, we, when she invited me to meet her family, right, she was like, he's like, he's really talking to you. He's like, yeah, what's wrong with that? He's like, he never talks to anybody, <laughs> right? He's like, well, he started to talk to me. I said, he's a fantastic guy. We're talking about all kinds of stuff, right? So he was, he was just an amazing guy. He tried to save some money at the Trade Center. The building fell on him, and this is a, a, a memorial to him at the 9-11 a monument. And this is kind of what we looked like before. I told you I'd get this picture, right? Yeah, this, is, this is my mom. My mom was truly a rock in our family, and she's the main reason I'm here today sharing my thoughts with you at this last lecture. She was an amazing person. As she got older, she aged gracefully. But I started to notice that she would start to forget things with time. And it just got worse and worse. Then she was diagnosed in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. And this would start a multi-year struggle for our family about what to do with her. You know, whether or not she could stay by herself or she needed to be in assisted living. And ultimately, we decided to help her and, and uh, put her in an assisted living facility. It was a hard adjustment for her, but she became fairly independent. And she was able to do stuff there and not go out, but she was able to do a lot of different things. In fact, she became the poster child for the assisted living facility. She actually appeared in newspaper advertisements for the place. As she deteriorated mentally, so did her health. She developed respiratory issues and had to be admitted, excuse me, to the ICU to be intubated. What followed was a long path towards her eventual death from problems including sepsis, paraplegia, pneumonia, and respiratory failure. It was hard to see her go through that slowly, but she was a real fighter until the last breath in the ICU. As an ICU doctor, seeing my mother go through all the pain and suffering she did was tough. But we supported her as much as we could, and if I, once I saw that I couldn't save her, then I decided to let her go and not push her anymore. But this is one of the most difficult things uh, for all of us. And when she died nine months ago, nine years ago now, um, I still miss her every day. So there's no, then you know I have a passion for music. And so it's important to have passion. I talk about passion for what you work in, passion for science, passion for medicine, passion for other things outside. So I have a big passion for music. I love to play music in the operating room when I'm at work, and I grew up with music. There was music all around. We heard reggae, R&B, everywhere. Music was a big part of our life. The Jacksons, Aretha Franklin, Bob Marley, and many others. I then studied the trumpet in school, played in a band, played in church. I was a bugle at Camp Rising Sun, as I told you. I have not played much recently, but I hope to pick it up uh, with time. In high school, my teacher brought Herbie Hancock to the class. That's Herbie Hancock over there. Many of you recognize him. And I started at that time really to sort of fall in love with the music of Miles Davis. And I still have 40 of his albums. Yeah, I still have vinyl. But I have most of his songs in MP3, so I play them anyway. I saw Miles one time when he was alive, and he did a really great concert. But of course, he ignored the audience 
right, the whole time. That was when Miles did. Miles would just, he would just play music. He'd turn his back to it. He would be like this. You know, he'd be playing music like this, right? And I was like, Miles, come on. <laughs> we paid some money to see you. Come on now. You know, we're passionate about your music. You know, we know every one of your songs. Like, you've got to play it. He's like, no, I'm, play, I'm playing for the other. I'm playing for the other people in the band, not for you guys. But he always did that. I enjoyed listening to jazz for 40 years. And we try to go out and, we, and when the artists come into town, we do that. I call that the three guys from Queens. The guy in, in the middle is actually Marcus Miller. Marcus Miller uh, wrote the bass line for Tutu, which won the Emmy Award when he was playing with Miles Davis. Now he basically has his own band and he basically, he brings um, folks along. The guy on the left is John Ellis. John is an anesthesiologist who's semi-retired now, but was a professor of anesthesia at, at, um, for 25 years at University of Chicago. That's John Coltrane, and that's um, up there. That's Terrence Blanchard. Terrence is a winner of many Grammy Awards. And I met Terrence as part of the SF Jazz Experience, so it's really been a fantastic place. And that's John Coltrane, for those of you who don't know who that is. I find that jazz is quite relaxing. I love to, to listen to it. I used to listen to it all the time in the operating room, but now I listen to rap, R&B, because it speeds up the cases. The residents <laughs> like it better, right? And I got used to doing that. Don't like the words too much, but I don't mind it. I like the beat, and it's pretty cool. I don't play it for, I don't play it during trauma cases, though. Now, we're getting to the important stuff here now. <laughs> so, as many of you know, maybe you don't. Like, I listen to Beyonce all the time in the operating room. I have multi, multiple Beyonce playlists. Right, I'm just all about Beyonce all the time. Now, my, my family and I, we went to see Beyonce, and of course, my son tells me, he's like, Dad, don't embarrass me. <laughs> right, it is 41,000 people there, but don't embarrass me. Now, there were 41,000 people, she put on a great show, and of course, she was there with Jay-Z, but it was really a Beyonce show. Yeah, she was there, but it was really her show. And we've gotten tickets to her show at Levi Stadium, and we'll go back and we'll see her again. Uh, with, with doing things when she returns to the Bay Area. So I think it's important to be passionate about, whether it is, be passionate about it. And passion is important in your work. So that's a message I want to have with you. So I want to just, I want to share with you some interesting things that happened to me over the last decade or so. I've really not been political much, but every election I voted since I was 18 because so many people gave up their lives to have the, 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 the right to vote. People protested, they fought to, to have the right to vote. The Voting Rights Act was written by or, or uh, signed by LBJ with the, with the encouragement from MLK and many other civil rights leaders, and it was truly amazing. I don't remember that, but I learned a lot from it from history. And we're still now fighting for rights as there's pushback up against the limitations of the voting access that it was put in place by our current Supreme Court. They ruled that states could reduce the limiting voting places, and hence now we have long lines and possible voter disfran disfranchisement like we had in the 1960s. I have to admit the recent presidential cycle has been hard to follow with lots of anger and hate being directed at minorities and immigrants, and I'm sure many of you feel the same way. I hope that cooler heads will prevail as we come down to the finish line on both sides. I was made aware of our current president when he made that spellbinding speech at the 204th Demo 200 2004 Democratic C Convention. So I began following his progress, and I was just, wow, who's this guy? He's pretty amazing. My wife and I were like, wow, this guy's amazing. In 2007, a friend who knew him, who, who actually we knew from our soccer league, asked us if we'd like to go to a fundraising for the then Senator Barack Obama at Oprah Winfrey's house in Montecito near Santa Barbara. Now, she was on the law review with President Obama, and they got to know each other, and there was a substantial dollar amount associated with this. But we looked at this, and we said, okay, well, Maybe we should go. And, but I said, well, one of us can go. So I said, well, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> and she was pissed. <laughs> I called my brother, who was a bond trader, right, and said if he could go along with me. We flew to Los Angeles, drove to Montecito. It was a pretty amazing sp experience for 1,300 people on Oprah Winfrey's front lawn. There were famous people everywhere. My, my brother and I, we just laughed. I mean. At the bottom there, that's President Obama on the left, that's Oprah Winfrey. There are 1,300 other people there. Now they said that the, the instructions were you're supposed to wear garden attire, right? Now since I don't know what garden attire looks like, right? That's my garden attire. I thought I was trying to look cool. 
So, but even the bathrooms were fancy. I mean, this, I just take a picture. This is granite and the porta potties, right? I mean, it had air conditioned porta potties with granite in it. I'm like, <laughs> this was like a whole nother level. So, we were fortunate enough to go to his inauguration. A friend helped us get pictures, uh, get seats, and we were off to DC. The incredible feeling for pride was truly amazing, and I think many of you probably felt the same thing. To actually go and see him become president was something. I thought I would never see a black man become a president during my lifetime. And he was president. Still is president. Wish he would be president some more. <laughs> so we didn't know if we were going to cry or scream or yell or laugh. But man, it was zero degrees. My son was eight when we went. And it was truly a wonderful experience for my wife and I and all the folks who went. And some of you probably went there too. It was really amazing. But I thought it was a turning point. Uh, but it really, inauguration is a four-day party. And man, there were some great parties we went to. Right, this is, this is one of the many balls that was going on. This is the president uh, um, dancing with, with his wife. Now, you could, tell, you could tell which one is which, right? That's 2009, that's 2013. You could tell that he's a lot, he has a lot more gray hair. So we were, we, were, we, we were so happy that he got it again, we had to go back a second time. It wasn't as cold that time. It was only 30 degrees as opposed to zero degrees. That's a big difference. So with Black Lives Matter movement, we see that there's a struggle for civil rights now version 2.0. I'm proud that our students, when they launched White Coats for Black Lives here at UCSF, put the spotlight on injustices. We have a lot to work to do, and this matter will not go away. On our campus, we're working to improve the climate under, under um, Dr. King, Dr. Navarro, Dr. Lowenstein, and Dr. Hallgood, and many others. And they're leading the way as we embark on a journey to improve the climate for diversity on our campus. Change will come slow, like in other places, but we're here to make the climate more receptive for underrepresented minorities. Faculty, support staff, and other rest of minority students, faculty, and support staff will work here. We still need to complete the work of the basement people who started the Black Caucus in 1968. The basement people, as you know, were the workers who could only work and eat in the basement, hence the term. They changed the campus in 1968, and we stand on their shoulders today and we'll continue our journey towards a more diverse campus, an inclusive campus. So I had a conversation, and I hope that some of you don't have to do this. I had a conversation with my son about the issue of driving while well, African American about a year ago. So when you're driving and you're black or brown, you gotta watch out. And I discuss, we discussed the importance of showing respect for the police when you're stopping, not saying anything too controversial or foolish, if I, if I could even use that word. I told him about a traffic stop I had during residency training when I was visiting my friend in Minor Del Rey. I was stopped by two officers. I was driving a car and they stopped me on a bike and they both drew their guns on two of me and my black friends in the car. Our car really was old and beat up. And the guy comes up with his gun drawn and he says, is this car stolen? And I told him no. It's like an old car, Jesus Christ. Why would anybody steal this piece of shit? <laughs> Please. Anyway, excuse me. Uh, then I identified myself as Dr. Campbell with two of my friends. I showed him the information he requested and he let us go. Two weeks after I told my son the story, he was stopped and he told me they remembered what I told him. And I said, wow, he remembered that. Imagine a teenager that remembered what I, what I, what I told him. That's pretty amazing. He gets extra points for that one. But I told him, as a large black man, you must be careful in those situations. And I hope many of you will not be forced to have that conversation with your children as, as we get old, as we get older and things change. I want to say a couple of things before I close, but I want to say that, that there's a learning curve in medicine. Some of us will take longer to master concepts. You must be persistent in difficult areas. There'll be days that you're on the top where no one could touch you. You'll feel like you're, you're the man or the woman. You'll be 10 feet tall on other days when you feel totally humbled by the clinical problem. There'll be times you'll nail the diagnosis and other times it'll take you longer. In the book, Complications, a surgeon's note with imperfect science, Atu Gawande discusses the difficulties we've learning new procedures like central lines and how we fumble through the first couple and then it's a snap. The first time someone asked me to place a central line, it was during a cardiac arrest situation. 
I didn't get, get it in the patient's vein, the patient passed away, but my, my failure did not reflect on the case. My patient expired when someone else was able to do it. When you first start doing something, you may not know why you can't complete the task, but with time it will become second nature. So in, a census, so in essence, you must be patient with yourself. Remember you heard it from a surgeon. You can't believe that. I think that may be an oxymoron. <laughs> Learning a new concept or procedure will be like, we'll, we like that sometimes. We're all humans, and you must acknowledge what you can and what you can't do. Always keep your patient best interests at heart. Call on the professionals, so the cavalry is very important. Use the phone early and often is something I could, I could, I could give you advice. Many nights as a resident have remained with me. I'd like to share with you one in particular. I was a resident of the medical intensive care unit. My wife was actually there that night too, but she went home. She was smart because she was an ICU nurse also. Okay, I was there. Everything was fine and all hell broke loose. Four of my patients had four cardiac arrests at the same time. So what did I do? The first thing I did was pray I had the strength to save all the patients. With help with two trusty interns and nurses, everyone made it through the next day. With the team of nurses and it, with my team of interns and nurses, you'll be able, to quick, be, be able to quickly pull somebody back from the precipice. These experiences will help you grow and mature as a physician. These moments that challenge us, as Rudyard Kipling says, keep your head about you when, you lose, when all others are losing theirs and blame it on you. These moments that listed such strengths as each of us reach down and come to the aid of our sick patients. After this event happened, all of a sudden the medical residents started treating me differently. I had done something that no one else had ever done. Because of that, they no longer doubted that I was a competent resident. I had another experience where I opened someone's chest who was shot through the chest, and I had a dramatic save. I was so excited that I was able to bring her back to life, and it was really celebrated because nobody had actually done that for a long time. I have many, many mentors to thank here, and some of them are in the audience. Uh, the first person is John Watson. John was a dean of admissions. Uh, that's John over there. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was admitted for UCSF, I have to say that when I applied to UCSF, I didn't even know where UCSF was. I spoke to a friend of mine who was a student here. He said, I'm at UCSF. And I said, where's that? That's a dumb New Yorker talking. Also, um, Hailey DeBass, who gave me my first job after I did went pretty well on the American Board of Surgery exam. I walked in and he actually gave me my exam and I, was, I thought I had failed, but he actually told me it was pretty good. Then he told me they'd give me a job because I did so well. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and that's not so bad. Do well on a test, get a job. That's a pretty good deal. And he was chair of surgery at the time. Gene Washington is a mentor. Bill Schecht, who was my boss for 15 years. Michael Drake, also a mentor. Michael is now um, the president of the Ohio State University. I thought he was sitting here also who helped me get my first grant from NIH when I worked in his lab. And, but there are many others. That's Karen Devaney again, Nancy Asher. There's many, many other folks who have been mentors and who basically supported me uh, through my journey here at UCSF, including Talmadge King, who's up in the, at the corner of Talmadge, worked for a long time at San Francisco General Hospital before he came here to be chief of medicine and then subsequently um, the, the dean. So, it's important that you have passion for work no matter what it is. Whether it's science, it's patient care, teaching or administration. The saying goes, if you love what you do, you never have a bad day at work. I'm always thinking about the next exciting operation that I'll be doing to help make my patient better. I'm always interested in riding on my white horse and saving the day. You need to balance, and I have to admit sometimes I have issues in that area, because I get wrapped up in saving somebody's life. I finally had to admit to myself after many years that I can't save everybody. Sometimes I am surprised, but this is a harsh reality in medicine. When a patient comes in with a problem, I feel like I'm watching a movie and I know how it's going to end sometimes. That old movie goes off and I'm like, here it comes. It's going to be bad. When they're young, it's hard. When it's older, it's a little bit more easier, but it's difficult no matter what. And I'd be remiss if I didn't share with you a difficult patient I cared for, and some of you may have heard me talk about this, but I couldn't talk about this publicly for a long time because it really hurt me. I operated on this patient 138 times. I kept him in the hospital 6.5 years. I spent $18 million trying to save his life. And I got him out of the hospital, but he had such a complex problem that he later died several years after I discharged him. 
It was hard for me to face the problem, but I finally was able to understand that there's some patients who have problems that we just don't understand. And I think that's, it took me a long time to recognize that. I've also been asked to help to advocate for the hospital at San Francisco General Hospital and care for the underserved. That is a, that was in, the, that picture I told my wife who wouldn't show any gross pictures, but that picture actually appeared on the front of, of the Chronicle, so I don't think it was, although it was kind of tough, that guy had just been shot by an AK-47 and he's covered, his hand is covering a gigantic hole in his right upper quadrant. That's me working on him later on. These are other things. And this was, I was fortunate to participate in some of the advocacy for the hospitals. We try to raise money for our new hospital facility and that's what a lot of other those things were. And that's me at the bedside talking to someone uh, as we sort of do it. And this was the big rollout of the bond issue now eight years ago. We're getting ready to open our new hospital. So no talk would be complete without me sharing you Campbellisms, right? Now some of them I stole from other people and I'll be honest with you, I stole them, right? But other things I did not, right? So I'm gonna just talk a little bit. The first one is, is that sometimes when I talk about the intestines, right, I talk the large intestines, I call it Big Stinky, I call it Mr. and Mrs. Colon or Kolonsky, but that's not my original term. The second thing that's a, that's a Campbellism is time out, I'm Dr. Dre and I'm bringing the pain today. Right? The other thing I'll say, some of you have heard me say this, that's why you're laughing, right? We have a nutritional emergency in the patient, right? That means that we're starving somebody and they're about to die, right? So we've got to fix them. Now, this is one of my favorites, airway breathing and a pineal problem. Now, this is something that some of you may have actually participated in because we had, we had adjusted the call schedule for one of the residents and he started complaining that he had, a, he had an upset day-night cycle when his, when his call schedule was adjusted. So that's when your call schedule is, is, is adjusted and you don't like it. And that applies to either residents or attendings also when you have to spend a lot of time in the hospital so you have an upset day-night cycle. We have a holy situation. I in Swiss cheese, that means that they were shot multiple times or stabbed multiple times. I examined a patient and I felt his soul or her soul. We got in there, it was, ter it was terrible. No, it was heinous. But it was terrible, it was the worst thing in the world. Hey guys, sorry I went to New York for a minute, but now I'm back. Now that means that, that I used fairly direct language in a very dramatic fashion. But only a New Yorker would understand that, right? You know what I'm talking about? You got that, right? So that's good. So um, other terms I've used is gaposis. That's, uh, we don't want to have an epidemic here. That means there's holes in between the wound, the defects in the wound. The other things I've used is I, we have a Humpty Dumpty situation here, right? That means that they fell down and we got to put them back together and it looks pretty bad. We're going to get hurt. That means it's a tough clinical problem. Uh, this is one of my favorites. I was trolling around looking for sick people in the ED, ICU, or operating room. Some of them being dead also, right? So, so it's amazing what I find when I'm trolling around at night. That's why I go trolling around at night. Now, Beyonce and Destiny's Child in 2001 had a song, Bootylicious. And if they can have that, I can have the bootyectomy. <laughs> now, a bootyectomy is defined as a radical resection of the junk in the trunk. That's only used for cases of severe necrotizing fasciitis. And I've done that operation many times, unfortunately. So the situation is filthy McNasty. It smells pretty bad. It's time to get funky. It's time to operate. Right, those of you who have been with me know that I've used those words quite a lot. So on your journey, you'll never know what will happen. People will be here to help you when you least expect them to come. It's truly an adventure when we started as a student like you, and that's what I started at the beginning of this talk, here some 23 years ago. I always thought I'd be in New York City. Uh, 23 years ago, I came out here with my, life, with my wife. We came out uh, on, a, on a California adventure with many chapters to write, and we continue to do that. I'm not sure what the next phase will be, so I'll continue to ask myself what I want to be when I grow up. Teaching, operating, and thinking about interesting questions continue to be a challenge. Your journey will be unique and will have many ups and downs. And I shared with you some of mine today. Keep focused on your goals even when it gets hard. I've always asked myself when it gets hard, how much do I want it, Dr. Dre? How do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be a surgeon when you hit a rough patch? And that could be hard. Then I'll get up and I'll move forward, not knowing how, uh, you know, that, that understanding that if you fall down, it's not so much if you fall down because you all fall down, 
It's how you get up and how you move forward. It is your resiliency in doing medicine and science and whatever you love will get you through what you have to get through. I have discussed my version of the last lecture, the importance of family, having passion for your career, the highs and the lows that you have, the impact of teachers, mentors, educators, and the importance of friendship, and I stress that in several different ways. I talked about the issue of social justice, and the issue, I also talked about cannibalisms. I have practiced the last man standing approach to my career. You may be smarter than me, you may be smoother, you may be cooler, you may be quicker, but I'll be standing when you fall down and can't get up. No one will work harder than me to get to my goal. This is the strong drive that I had since I was young. I've always been dedicated, working my projects that I had to do and, and making sure that my patients got great care. This is probably how I became the accidental trauma surgeon because I excel at cleaning up messes. Never be discouraged when you have a difficult situation. My job as a teacher is to make you better than I am. I'm a physician, a surgeon, and if you're better than I am, then I've done my job. Thank you for your time tonight, and thank you for allowing me to give the last lecture.